Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Hooper. I'm the Vice Chancellor for University Development and Alumni Relations here at Berkeley. And I just want to say good morning, welcome. We are thrilled to be gathered here today to reconnect with each other, adventure into AI, and meet our new chancellor. We are also here to say thank you. Thank you to all of you um, for choosing to spend your morning with us, for your meaningful gifts and your engaged participation in the Benjamin Ied Wheeler Society, and for making the Berkeley dream possible for so many in so many ways. Um, as you know, the Wheeler Society is named for Benjamin Ide Wheeler, the University of California president from 1899 to 1919. Uh, by working with the great philanthropists and visionaries of his day, Wheeler transformed Berkeley from a small Western university to one of the most distinguished centers of learning in the world. He also arranged UC's very first planned gift from Jane K. Sather, it led to the building of our most cherished landmark, the Campanile. Now, as many of you may have heard, um, Berkeley recently completed Light the Way, a 10-year campaign that raised an historic $7.37 billion for our students, faculty, research, and facilities. Thank you. Because of the foresight and generosity of our Wheeler Society members, all of you, um, that triumphant total includes $525 million in realized estate distributions, $56 million in new life income gifts, and $553 million in new planned gift commitments from donors who turned 70 by the end of the campaign. We just want you to know, again, that your support plays a crucial role in ensuring a stable fiscal foundation for generations at Berkeley to come. So thank you so much for being a part of and continuing this extraordinary tradition of giving. Again, thank you to all of you. Round of applause for you. So now I'd like to introduce today's featured faculty speaker, uh, Jill Finlayson, Managing Director of the Citrus Innovation Hub. The hub is part of the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society and the Banatow Institute, which facilitate interdisciplinary work among faculty and students at four UC campuses, um, as well as corporate partners and international institutions. Citrus overall works on shaping technology to bear on the world's critical challenges such as sustainable energy, water, transportation systems, healthcare, and the future of work. Its innovation hub is focused on diversifying and nurturing next generation talent and on speeding up technological progress and impact. So please join me in welcoming Jill who will explore the ways that Berkeley is integrating AI to solve these pressing problems. Thank you, Jill. Welcome. This is wonderful to be in this room with all of these people with blue and gold running through their veins. Very exciting. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm pleased to give you a small look at the way Berkeley is leading innovation. I'm Jill Finlayson, as they said, and Managing Director of Citrus, the Center for IT Research in the Interest of Society. And we are committed to innovation in climate, in health, and in aviation. We provide seed funds and awards to help Berkeley innovators go from lab to market. And I'm excited to share how this ethos of innovation in the interest of society really permeates Berkeley's approach to AI and innovation. <clears throat> I have the pleasure of working with these students here. I have led a challenge lab, which is a class called Designing Startups to Transform Society. And this challenge lab is astonishing to see the ideas and startups that come out of this class. To help these students go from idea to startup in just 15 weeks, we also tapped other students who had been through the entrepreneurship cycle themselves and asked them 
to peer coach their fellows. And this allowed us to develop better, faster startups with less errors and less problems. We call them innovators in residence, and you can see this first group here. Their generosity of spirit, their commitment to helping others, get their idea out the door is phenomenal. So let's talk about how Berkeley grows more startup founders like these fine folks through our centers, our faculty, and our researchers. Fun fact, UC Berkeley trains many of the people who go on to become faculty at other campuses, other universities. By incorporating responsible innovation into our curriculum, we are actually making curriculums across the country and globe more ethical. When we talk about leading in AI, we're really talking about three things. How we're leading in promoting ethical development of AI. How we are changing education for the better with AI. And how we are providing a home base for innovators using AI to solve global challenges. But first, let's talk about the life cycle of a mushroom. <laughs> You, you might well ask why. Why would we want to talk about the mushroom? Let's talk about the mushroom because like many mushrooms start off as spores floating in the air, Berkeley helps release ideas into the environment through formal and informal education from classes to research to student groups. Berkeley is germinating change makers. And those ideas take root as the ideas formalize through networks, a supportive ecosystem, much like the hidden root structure of the mushroom. As the mycelium produces the nutrients and moisture that mushroom, mushrooms need, so does the robust decentralized network provide innovators with training, structure, guidance, funding they need to form fully developed startups. Without a top-down or centralized structure, New incubators and courses are popping up all over campus, from neurotech labs to blockchain accelerators to quantum incubators to nurturing the next generation of space startups. This makes Berkeley agile, proactive, and able to foster rapid innovation in response to changing societal needs. And to really have impact at scale, just as animals help the mushrooms reach new places, Alumni, like yourselves, help startups to reach mentors, donors, and investors who can help them move from proof of concept to sustainable and thriving companies that make the world a better place. This is how our decentralized innovation ecosystem produces such a large number of mushrooms, I mean startups, in the, <laughs> with global distribution. According to PitchBook, Berkeley is the top university in, no, in the number of venture-funded startups founded by undergraduate alumni and the number one public university for startup founders. Well, it is true that not all spores are good, uh, how do we avoid turning out black mold companies? Uh, and instead grow startups that are beneficial to society. More importantly, how are we growing responsible and ethical innovators who go on to start multiple companies? To answer that question, we need to understand what is responsible and ethical AI. How many of you have heard about the trolley car problem? Okay, I see a few of you out there. Um, the gist of this problem is that there's a trolley that is out of control and it's barreling toward a person who is on the track. You are at the helm of a switch that could divert that trolley onto another track, saving that person's life, but putting five others at risk. Do you divert the car? Do you do nothing and let that person get hit? Does it matter if that person on the track is a child and the other five are adults? Does it matter if the person is an important leader and the others are workers? The point is there are a lot of gray areas and these ethical decisions are hard. It depends on the value of the community or the country, the culture. 
It depends on how we define our terms. What is fairness? It depends on trade-offs, and there's always going to be trade-offs. So no problem is ever the same, but we need to ensure and train our students to think about these difficult choices so that when they are innovating, they can ask better questions and have the critical thinking skills to assess their approach for the benefit of society. So to level set, artificial intelligence automation, of course, has been around for a long time and is embedded in a lot of the technology we use. Importantly, AI is defined by human objectives and can support or augment human capabilities. It can reduce risk, it can reduce repetitiveness, and work that really doesn't leverage human creativity and empathy. Generative AI, on the other hand, has burst onto the scene relatively recently, and it's still in its infancy. infancy. Generative AI, like ChatGPT, can generate new content, pictures, music, based on examples it has seen, and it's seen a lot of examples. It literally is predicting the next word or pixel based on thousands of prior examples. So the output can look pretty good and sound fairly human. However, it is only a prediction. It may not be true. And that is why you hear about AI hallucinating or making things up. This is actually by design, it's generating. Now you can create guardrails and instructions. And so this comes back to people and how we set those human objectives. What is the peril? There is a lot of peril with AI, and that's why we have to be so careful. Uh, the big risks stem from the data that the AI trains upon. If we do not address poor quality or biased data, then the algorithms can not only replicate those biases, they can do so at scale literally automating and spreading incorrect information. Oftentimes, these problems have disproportionate impacts on certain populations, especially those who are underrepresented in the data sets. Of course, people are not perfect either. We know this to be true. Research shows that judges give harsher penalties before lunch when they are hungry. So please don't judge me right now. <laughs> Just after, after lunch. Um, People involved in hiring processes may unconsciously or consciously be biased in favor of, quote, white sounding names. People change slowly. However, algorithms with effort and positive intent can be changed to make them more equitable and inclusive. Which brings us to tremendous benefits of AI, including equity, efficiency, effectiveness. I mean, okay, imagine your last job that you had. What aspects of your job did you enjoy? I'm guessing it was the people. It was the creativity. What aspects of your last job did you find the most taxing? I'm not super fond of expense reports, right? You know, the things that are repetitive work and uninspiring work, right? Those are the things you didn't enjoy. So the promise of AI is to reduce the parts of work that least benefit from human ingenuity, to free you up for more impactful work, to truly augment your capabilities, to allow you to do more, be more thoughtful, and accomplish more. Those productivity gains are only gonna be realized if we implement AI responsibly. This comes down to the data we use and the practices we establish to ensure accountability, ethics, and transparency. And there are a number of people upon whose shoulders we stand. This is, the first one is Sophia Noble from UCLA, an author of Algorithms of Oppression. Caroline Criado Perez wrote Invisible Women on how many things in our society are designed specifically for men. Fefe Li, in her book, The Worlds I See, is focused on making AI a force for good, Dr. Joy Bellowini has done tremendous work unmasking AI and bias in facial recognition. And Kathy O'Neill was out in front with her sector-defining book, Weapons of Math Destruction. So we're gonna take a look at how Berkeley is leading responsible AI with the goal of turning out innovators who put safety and inclusion first who have a tremendous understanding of how we can define fairness and mitigate for bias, 
who prioritize monitoring outcomes, because the data is going to change, to ensure that we have avoid unhar harmful unintended consequences. We don't have a Food and Drug Administration for algorithms right now, at least not yet. So to ensure that algorithms do no harm, we need our researchers and innovators leading that charge. Keep in mind, what I'm going to share with you is the tip of the iceberg, a bento box, if you will, a sampling, a sampling of the amazing AI leaders on campus and some people that I think you'd really like to know. One thing you will notice is that all the images in this presentation are AI generated. Yeah. Here I used image to cartoon to illustrate our AI leaders. Uh, bonus here, it makes them look about 10 years younger. So if you need a little, yeah. Um, this is my colleague at Citrus. Brandy Nonicky is the founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab. She actually advises government legislators on AI legislation and tech policy. Through training, she's also leading work to create regulation and guardrails to enable innovation and protect society. She hosts a program called Tech Hype, where she debunks myths about emerging technologies and promotes transparency and increasing understanding for everyone about the risks and safeguards needed for these new technologies. <clears throat> She initiated a collaboration with the Goldman School of Public Policy to create our first Berkeley Tech Fellows program, drawing in experts and practitioners across various fields. This program has attracted leaders from the former head of trust and safety at Twitter to the senior advisor of the German chancellor. Perhaps one of the most well-known uh, leaders in AI from Cal is Professor Stuart Russell who gave a very popular talk at Citrus on how not to destroy the world with AI. <laughs> the three, <clears throat> three key tenets he champions are ensuring AI systems understand and prioritize human values, regulating to address the potential misuse, and prioritizing safety and control in how we design our AI systems. Assistant Professor Nilafar Salehi's work centers around fairness and equity. She has compiled a very useful glossary of human-centered AI terms and best practices. One of the equity issues she is addressing is reliable translation. It turns out AI is pretty good at translating into English, but is less accurate when translating from English into other languages. And this can have critical implications, especially when a doctor's directions are incorrectly translated to the patient. Another way AI is having an impact on people's safety is in the realm of privacy and security. Jessica Newman is the director of the Artificial Intelligence Security Initiative and co-director of the AI Policy Lab. At AFOG, the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Group they have brought together a truly interdisciplinary group, research group with folks from information studies, sociology, law, communication, media studies, computer science, and the humanities to address issues such as surveillance. Among some of their goals, they are developing methodologies for auditing algorithms and assessing their impacts on different demographic groups. For example, they, the use of algorithms in predictive policing their work has led to recommendations for improving fairness in law enforcement strategies. Deborah Raji earned her PhD in computer science here at Berkeley and has worked with Google's ethical AI team, the Partnership on AI, the AI Now Institute, and her focus is on not only promoting fairness, but developing industry standards for transparency. She is currently a Mozilla Fellow and has been recognized by MIT Technology Review and Forbes as one of the world's top young innovators. <laughs> Professor Haney Farid is renowned for his digital forensic work in misinformation and deepfakes. I would not be surprised if you hear a lot about him this fall. His startup, Get Real Labs, is addressing the real consequences of deepfakes and identifying new ways to differentiate authentic material from AI-generated fakes. I participated online in a research project that asked me to identify if a photo was real or AI-generated. I did really well compared to others. Um, in this case, that meant I could identify fakes 60% of the time. That means 40% of the time, I could not tell. 
And AI technology right now is the worst it's ever going to be. And so my feedback on how I could tell the fakes, like ears not matching or the neck not looking right, will no doubt contribute to making the next fakes even better. So we really need Haney's work, which goes down to that microscopic level. Assistant Professor Irene Chen is part of a collaboration between Berkeley and the University of California in San Francisco. They identify and mitigate biases within AI algorithms to prevent disparities in healthcare outcomes. She's auditing these large language models to ensure that they perform equitably across different demographic groups. In one case, Irene found that the algorithms used to analyze chest radiographs underdiagnose patients from underserved populations due to inherent biases in the data sets. This led to poor health outcomes for these populations. This, their research has even extended into improving equity in the handling of health insurance claims by integrating socioeconomic data into the models and applying fairness constraints. I'm sure many of us are looking forward to the day when me, many of the menial tasks around the house will be taken care of by robots. I myself have one of those robotic vacuums and have been surprised to suddenly find the vacuum underfoot because it is it's traveling around. Uh, enter. Professor Anka Dragon, who heads up the Interact Lab, which is focused on how AI agents work with, around, and in support of people. For example, say you wanted your robot to help you unload the dishwasher. The way that the robot presents you with the mug matters. Anka is training AI on how to implicitly help the person and avoid suboptimal solutions, like being handed the mug upside down, using a prob probabilistic model of how humans grasp. So you can naturally take the mug and put it away. On the grand scale, this research affects how AI agents and robots interact effectively and safely with humans. There is, of course, a trade-off with our capitalistic world between corporate privacy, trade secrecy, and the need for transparency and accountability. Professor Sonia Cattell is trying to improve disclosure to enable courts to investigate while protecting company information. We could amend trade secret status to allow for freedom of information and judges to have greater access. There are many other legal issues of both arising and unresolved, including creators whose images have been used to train AI without their permission or compensation, actors protecting their images and voices from AI replication, and there is a suit against a company called Workday, a company that filters job applicants for other companies. They are now facing discrimination charges as a de facto hiring company. So looking at how regulation can support rather than stifle innovation is one of the areas of research for Genevieve Smith, who is part of VAIR, the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Lab. She wrote the Haas playbook on mitigating bias in AI and is now leading the way in engaging Haas business students in discussing responsible AI. Her course kicks off with a business case for responsible AI, you're gonna make more money if you do it right, and engages the students in a debate on whether university students should be able to use ChatGPT, generative AI, at school. Which brings me full circle here to AI for education. And it really is a full circle moment for me because my first job after leaving Berkeley was at the learning company, an early leader in ed tech and committed to helping students learn at their own pace and build self-esteem. That's Reader Rabbit right there. And let's just say he would be about 40. <laughs> he would be about 40 now. Um, I'm really excited to see how the role of AI can re play in reinventing education. I had the privilege to host a podcast with the University of California Berkeley Extension office, and we talk about the future of work. Not surprisingly, many of the topics are veering into impact of AI on the future of work and the future of learning. One of the recent guests talked about the importance of giving deskless workers, people who are not tethered to a desk, access to AI to enable them to problem solve on the job and upskill themselves. One of our earlier guests was Itai Shu, a Berkeley Extension faculty member. He talked about his conversations with students and how they saw AI as a way of getting unstuck and learning, not as a way to cheat, 
When I asked him the big question about AI and education, he smartly said, I don't know what the right answer is, but I know what the two wrong answers are. Banning the use of AI outright or leaving it up to teacher to figure out. So if we need our students to be proficient with these technologies and productivity tools, and we do, and we have empathy for teachers who are facing this new classroom, what do we do? This is a recent graduate from the School of Education. Ia Yang is championing designing the future of learning and education with her podcast and by launching Bell Innovators, Berkeley's education and learning innovators community. She convened an amazing group for a kickoff event, including Mathilde Ciroli, who wrote this report here on the future of child development in the AI era. This is a really new era. We're talking about children who are AI native and how their life is gonna be very much different. Also on that panel was Christina Serrano, a member of Berkeley Changemaker faculty. She's offering a course this summer on exploring digital pedagogy to look at how digital tools, including AI, spatial community, computing, virtual reality, and augmented reality are transforming the learning experience. Also spearheading the academic charge this fall is Deirdre Mulligan, who asked students to look behind the data and consider legal, ethical, and policy-related concepts throughout the entire life cycle of data, from collection, to storage, to analysis, to application, to algorithms. As you've gathered from this discussion so far, it is critical to understand the data and how and why the data was collected and who labeled the data. All of these things can affect the outcomes. But who is training the teachers? In this cleverly titled paper, Assigning AI, Executive Director of the Center for Teacher and Learning, Janae Cohn, proposes seven approaches for utilizing AI in the classrooms, each with their own distinct pedagogical benefits and risks. The goal is to help instructors harness the power of AI to further their learning goals. One of the other aims is to avoid complacency about the AI's output, errors, and biases. For both faculty and students, there are ways to use AI as a partner, as a tutor, but not as an author or a lead instructor. It is increasingly hard to define cheating. How do we ensure students are not passing off others' work as their own? How do we ensure that they're actually learning? Let's look at Berkeley's largest co course, Data 8. It introduces students to AI and machine learning through real-world applications, including automated cancer detection. 3,000 plus students are taking this course each year, which is about 30% of all Berkeley undergraduates. This is great news. All students need exposure to this topic, but it's also a great challenge. John De Niro is one of the developers of the course and the data science major, and he asked the question, how do we manage a class of this size? It turns out high quality feedback matters, timely feedback matters, and students ask a lot of questions, a lot, thousands and thousands of questions. And some of those questions are the same, and some of those questions are new, and they only have so many graduate student instructors. So John teamed up with Professor Nargis Norazi, and they developed a large language models tailored to specific classroom interactions such as asking questions online or solving programming problems. This improves the student experience by providing faster and more thorough feedback and answers to their questions. The graduate student instructors save time on repeat questions and Edison, the EdSTEM bot, gives them prompts to enable them to improve the responses and provide new answers. Bonus, the students are actually spending less time waiting at office hours, they're spending less time being stuck and not making any forward progress on their homework, and their test scores are remaining strong because Berkeley is an academic institute, so they're measuring all of these things to see what are the outcomes. They have developed an AI solution to also, well, first of all, I should say, they've open sourced this, we're a public university, so they have taken this innovation and they're making it available for anyone to innovate and create this custom tutoring for their, their courses. They've also developed an AI solution to generate various versions of the same test to deter cheating, right? Can't look across at the paper next to you. And here's the thing, so this is Sue Jay, the Dean of the College of Engineering, and uh, Dean Liu said, hey, 
you know, if we can create multiple tests for testing, why can't we create multiple tests for practice tests and give them feedback so they can learn and fill any gaps in knowledge or education that they have? Because people come from all different schools and universities, and this allows them to learn and fill those gaps so that by the time they take the test, they can do really well. Also building upon this open source AI tutoring and adaptive learning solutions is Zach Pardos. His open adaptive tutor enables the tutoring to make instructional decisions tailored to assessments it's making of the student in real time. So this is adaptive, it's learning. What are they, what are they understanding? What are they not understanding? And he pointed out what took the longest was the creation of hints. How do you help the student without giving them the answer? The results of their pilot showed that hints definitely helped, but that there was no statistically significant difference between learning from the manually created tips and the chat GPT hints. This software helps community colleges to have more credit mobility by assessing the courses for credit equivalency. They can even do custom created lessons to help make up the difference instead of retaking the course. The system is open source and free to anyone to create their own custom tutor, and Zach has been also conducting equity and fairness audits to see how it works for different students, and he was able to improve the algorithm's intersectional fairness, not just for women or for you know, people of color, but intersections and making sure that it works equitably for everyone. And one of the people who is most excited about encouraging transfer students and looking to the community college is Jennifer Chase, Dean of the College of Computing, Data Science, and Society, Berkeley's first new college in more than 50 years. One in five data science students is a transfer student. Women make up nearly half of the data science population. And the whole ethos of the college is around being interdisciplinary, ethical, and supporting progress on societal issues. Jennifer also participated in the first joint California summit on generative AI with Governor Gavin Newsom to focus on how the state can best use generative AI to better serve the people of California. One of the labs in CDSS is BIDMAP, or the Baker Institute for Digital Materials for the Planet. Chemistry professor Omar Yagi just won the Tang Prize for his work turning water molecules from desert air into drinkable water and he sped up the process of chemistry discovery using AI. He even started a company, a TOCO, to tackle global warming and water scarcity. And he's not alone. He, Professor Kenichi Soga, together with CEO Sarah Lindbergh, started a company using AI to help communities and agencies effectively respond to wildfire events by providing interactive tools and digital twins. And they're currently pursuing their phase two of their SBI funding of 1.5 million. There's also Professor Gu, who's developing bio-inspired AI-optimized materials for manufacturing. My point is that Berkeley is not just innovating, we're commercializing. We are helping our faculty and students and alums go from lab to market and to launch their AI companies, and we already have some heavy hitters out there. Adjunct Professor Ali Godsey is the CEO of Databricks, and you can see the Berkeley ethos in their mission statement simplifying and democratizing data and AI to help data teams solve the world's toughest problems. Alumnus John Schulman is co-founder of OpenAI, the nonprofit whose mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. And Professor Peter Abiel is co-founder of Covariant, and as a researcher, he set out to take their advancements in the lab to real settings in need of AI robotics, getting out of the building talking with real customers and finding that product market fit and building things that the world really needs. Nobel laureate Jennifer Doudna points out that CRISPR is a powerful tool that can make large libraries of guide RNAs, but it's also daunting because it generates large collections of data that are difficult to manually inspect. Imagine that we have ways of training models that can look at, gen that can look at genetic intersections and even how a person responds to drugs this allows us to make better predictions about genetic outcomes. She also joined the scientific advisory board for Isomorphic, a company using AI to accelerate drug discovery. Because we are using AI to predict, for example, how a small molecule might interact with a particular protein in a virtual setting, 
rather than a lab, we can get away with doing fewer experiments because we know the right ones to do. Named one of Time's 100 most influential people in AI in 2023, Ziad Obermeyer has started two companies to improve outcomes in health tech startups. Nightingale Open Source, Open Science is a platform that connects researchers with world-class medical data. Working closely with health systems around the world, they create and curate data sets of medical images and carefully de-identify that data and make it available for nonprofit research. And Dandelion is helping the for-profit startups by providing millions of comprehensive longitudinal health records with the mission to catalyze clinical innovations that work for everyone. But of course, it's not just our faculty who are innovating, it's our students. Harken back to our mushroom farm ecosystem that we discussed at the start of the conversation. And here we have our winners of the Big Ideas contest. Big Ideas is one of my favorite startup programs at Cal. It helps students with transformative ideas and just ideas, just sort of a glint in their eye, to solve real world problems. Through workshops and funding, they help the student innovators go from just an idea to startup. The top winners this year used AI and came from the electrical engineering side of the house. Meet the grand prize winner, Ashmita Kumar, whose company, Code Blue, helps detect the early signs of stroke from the phone or tablet you spend so much time staring at. And runner-up, Ojos Karnavat, uh, started Synaptrix Labs to revolutionize mobility for those with severe motor impairments through a non-invasive brain-computer interface that can control wheelchair direction and movement. I mentioned the SET Challenge Lab, the one that I run at the start of this talk. These courses culminate in a Collider Cup pitch event. And this year, one of the top winners was Optogenics, started by two Cal athletes, Jai Williams and Gabe Aves. They are using AI to help performance athletes optimize their supplements for their specific body and for their specific sport. The things that you need to do for hurdles is not the thing you need to do for other sports. So really understanding their area of expertise and applying the technology to solve that problem. The Sports Tech Challenge Lab brought in many who might not have otherwise taken a startup course. In fact, the athletes almost swept the Collider Cup with three teams among the top finishers. And of course, the Haas Business School churns out its fair share of founders. This is one of my favorite founders from Haas, also a transfer student, also a veteran. Manny Smith and his company, Advisorly, are making it easier for community college students to take the right courses and successfully transfer to public and private universities. Their new Eddy AI is even helping universities to improve enrollment success with transcript reading and evaluation AI services. Fun fact, Don McGee was just hired as the new executive director of the Berkeley Haas Entrepreneurship Hub a physical home for innovators at Cal, drawing in students not just from the business school, but from any major across the campus. They will serve as a concierge, connecting people with ideas to the entrepreneurship resources they need. And of course, the big kahuna is Skydeck uh, for incubating startups. Some of their latest AI success stories include DeepScribe AI, started by alumni Ekalesh Babu and Matthew Ko, and they have raised 30 million. Visiting scholar Jorge Torres raised 25 million for Mind SPD, which also shines an important light on the fact that Berkeley helps innovators from around the world. Whether visiting scholars or visiting students or even visiting faculty from universities abroad, Berkeley is helping innovators from around the world make their ideas into a reality. And it is our hope that you are inspired by these innovators as well as Berkeley's ability to push the AI industry toward greater inclusion, fairness, and responsibility. Thank you for your continued support and engagement in making Berkeley the leader in AI and in making our world better. With your support, we will see even more Berkeley startups and our ethos of equity thriving here and around the world. I look forward to your questions, and here I share the slides and the resources if you're interested in learning more. Thank you so much for being here. And thank Julie and the Wheeler Society for having me. I'll turn it over to Julie for some okay. questions. Thanks, Jill. Big round of applause. So, Jill, we, 
we do stand between lunch, but we've got some questions for you. So here's the first one. Are there any state or federal legislative proposals that deserve our monitoring and support? I would say to go to the Citrus Policy Lab where she keeps a running uh, tracking of different proposals and legislation. There are different legislations in different places. In Illinois, there's some legislation that's leading, so I can't give you a specific answer to that, but that's something we can follow up with more details on, and I'll con con consult my colleague, Brandy Nonake. Okay, great. We can send the links out, too. Um, so, Jill, we would all agree that AI needs to be ethical and values-based, but whose values? Christian values, Muslim values, the Ten Commandments, etc. That's this, a very is, easy question. Yeah, this is one of the big challenges, and that's why I talked about how AI is really dependent on the culture, the community, the context. In some places, you know, the, the seniors are very revered, and other places, children are very revered. So all of these trade-offs are going to vary, and that's what makes having a global standard very challenging because people have different opinions on this. But I think just having the conversation is what promotes a, a better conversation and thought to prevent unintended consequences. Thank you for that. Um, so on the theme of black mold, <laughs> um, do guardrails exist to deter destructive AI out there or under development or once the cat's out of the bag, dot, dot, dot. So there are, there is a need for more guardrails. We don't have enough of these. In many ways, I would say Europe is leading the way, and our companies that want to be global will conform with the European standards and others. Um, but that is a challenge right now, because at this point in time, there are not a lot of guardrails. And so one of the things that we talked about is if we can provide regulation where we define some of these guardrails and fairness, we're actually helping innovators because then they know where the boundaries are and they know how to define these things. Otherwise, we have everyone defining these as they see. And the other thing is they're not going to prioritize it unless there's a reason to prioritize it. So public opinion matters. The customer matters. So the uh, University of California passed a, a rule that said, if you want to sell to us, and actually the Washington DC, the US government said, if you want to sell to us, you have to comply with these guardrails. So we're taking a sort of capitalistic approach to this to say, if you want to sell to a big customer, then you need to be responsible and ethical. But we have not passed laws that restrict kind of how innovation happens. Thank you. Okay, this is the last question. It's a little bit long. Um, Humans learn from training sets, other humans around them, writing and pictures, nature, secondhand experience. How do the training sets differ between humans and AI? How do these differences affect what humans and AI put out? Could training sets for AI be designed to make its outputs more human? Yes, um, there is a lot of detail that we could go into here, but there's a lot of ways of training AI, some of which has human intervention and modification, some of it is AI learning from itself, but always monitoring the outcomes is really critical and having the human involved in the monitoring of the outcomes to see if we're achieving the success that we want. And I just got a late breaking question. Um, any thoughts about Google firing their AI ethics diversity staff last year? This is something that I, I do take very personally. We've also seen a very strong DEI uh, backlash and firing out people who are working on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that this is unfortunate. I think it's short-sighted. And I think the best companies will retain their leadership in this area and participation in the dialogue to develop standards. Thank you, yes. So another round of applause for Jill Finlayson. Thank you, Jill, fascinating. We really appreciate you being here. Um, so we're gonna serve lunch now, and in about 45 minutes, we're gonna hear from Chancellor Lyons. So we're delighted to welcome you to the second part of the program with um, a conversation and a Q&A with Carl Wayne and Chancellor Rich Lyons. Let me just do a quick introduction. Uh, Carl Wayne joined UDAR's Office of Gift Planning as its Executive Director back in January. 
And of course, Chancellor Rich Lyons has been on the job 19 days. <laughs> uh, a little bit about, a little background, just very quickly. Carl has held advancement roles at the University of Washington and at UCLA, which is his alma mater, so he's in the family. Um, UNCF, United Way, and the American Heart Association. Charitable gift planning is his chosen career and his daily lifelong passion. We like that. And then, of course, no stranger to Berkeley, Rich Lyons is the first undergraduate alum to serve as our chancellor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, he was the dean of Berkeley Haas, as many of you know, and over the past four years, he led the development and expansion of innovation and entrepreneurship campus-wide. So the way this is gonna work is Carl's going to ask our esteemed chancellor a few questions so we can get to know more about his experience and his vision for Berkeley, and then we're gonna open it up to you for questions. As a reminder, you do have note cards and pencils, index cards and pencils on the table, so we will collect those, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carl and Chancellor Lyons. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyway, good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to meet all of you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for all of your generous support um, to UC Berkeley. We appreciate it. And I appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation uh, with Chancellor Lyons, my first time meeting him, and welcome to the job. Thank you, thank you. Okay. All right. And so I'm gonna ask him a few questions and I'm gonna start off with a biographical uh, question, if you will. So you have said that you never could have imagined the life you have led had you not studied at Berkeley. Can you tell us about a person or an experience that shaped your undergraduate experience and beyond? Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Julie. Uh, let me start with Go Bears. Can I start with that? Why not? Why not? Um, we're, we're in this together, and we've been in this together for a long time. I, you know, I think this is true of a lot of us. I think it, it's why a lot of us are here, that we really couldn't have imagined the life that, that has, has, this world has afforded us, and Berkeley plays a big role in, in how that happened. Certainly did for me. A phrase that I love to use as, as an educator is, you can't be what you can't see. They're just, you know, when you're 18, 19, 20, there's just a lot of futures you can't see in yourself. Um, neither of my parents had a four-year college degree, so the idea of getting a PhD and becoming an academic, not on my radar screen. And I mean, like, really not. It was sort of, uh, I have two older brothers, seven and eight years older than I am. One of them came to Cal, which is kind of my introduction to Berkeley. And um, so when I got here, I was a business major. I was very, I wanted to go into business, right? Anyways, um, there was a faculty member who pulled me aside. I was a sophomore. I'd written a midterm in a macroeconomics class. And I think the midterm had gone well. I hadn't ever talked to her in her office hours. She said, come see me. And among other things, she said, have you ever thought about maybe going on in economics? Maybe getting a PhD in economics? It's like, that's a crazy question. What do you, no, I, I didn't say that, but that's kind of what I thought. She didn't just ask me that question, though. Uh, she introduced me to other young faculty members at Berkeley. She helped me get letters of recommendation written. I mean, she, you've heard the distinction between a mentor and a sponsor. She was a sponsor. She made opportunities available for me. So, you know, I get choked up telling the story because it was that transformational for me. And that's part of, part of why I'm here, yeah. Very nice. Um, next question. Two hallmarks of your Berkeley career have been forging new partnerships and programs and implementing sweeping cultural changes. What accomplishments are you most proud of up to this point? Well, thanks. You know, one of, this is true of, of any role like one like this or the roles that I've had before. You know, you work with an awful lot of people. So I'll, I'll give you some examples, but obviously the, this wasn't, wasn't just me, but being, being part of a, a group of people that help make these things happen. Um, you know, when I, I'll start with the, the partnership side of things. We, we launched a, uh, two or three dual degree programs. You know, this kind of cross training, like engineering plus business. Uh, some of you may have heard of MET, Management, Entrepreneurship, and Technology. But you enter Berkeley being in both the engineering major and the business major. And you leave with a BS in engineering and a BS in business. 
And sort of you code those two fields together in an 18, 19, 20, or any year old's brain. And it's not like, oh, I got an undergraduate science degree, and then I went on six years later and got an MBA. It's sort of like they are fully integrated. And so that, that kind of, you, we talk about interdisciplinarity a lot. It's sort of like, let's like harden it. Let's drive it right into the, the structure of the university. And we now have a, a biology plus business uh, dual degree program. And some of these are at the graduate level as well. So I think that, that dual degree programming, uh, cross training, if you will, of, of undergraduates, these are really exciting programs. And you know, they're, they're sort, I, I hate to sound too competitive, but they're, they're world beating. They're like the best anywhere. They're just, it's just phenomenal to put two great things together and, and have something that's that distinctive. And then the, the second piece, you mentioned culture. Um, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll use the word obsessed. I'm, I'm obsessed with how um, leaders shape culture. Leaders shape shared values and, and shared behavioral norms and so forth. And one of the things we did at the Haas School was we borrowed from the essence of Berkeley, we borrowed from the essence of the mothership, but for those of you that are close to the Haas School, we wrote down four principles, and we called them defining principles. Uh, we didn't call them core values. Some of the faculty said, no, no, the school doesn't tell me what my core values are. But we, we, we wanted to, you know, so there, was, there were a lot of stages in this process. But the four things that we wrote down were question the status quo, you know, this idea that there's gotta be a better way to do this. And, you know, there, there are an awful, just let me give you an example. If, if, if I were the president of Namur University, whatever, Harvard University, and I'm standing up here and, and sitting up here and I say, Harvard University, I, I, I don't mean any disrespect to Harvard, Harvard's great. Um, but, but, if, but if Harvard, president of Harvard stood up here and said, Harvard University, we're all about questioning the status quo. It's not gonna happen. Now, there are plenty of people at Harvard who are questioning the status quo, that's not the point. It's just not where that institution comes from. And it is where we come from. This is not just an unobjectionable value. It's, it's a profoundly separating value, and it's really a valuable value. All right, so question the status quo. Confidence without attitude. True confidence comes without arrogance. Do we get that exactly right? We do not, but are we distinctive relative to the great universities of this country in this, in this category? We are. Game on. Let's, let's play that card, right? And let's use it for admissions. This isn't just going on a, a, a poster, right? Let's change admissions. All right, confidence without attitude, question the status quo. Students always, will we understand at the end of our life, we still have more to learn, right? So it's not just lifelong learning. And the last one, beyond yourself, these are in no particular order, but a commitment to, to, the, to the, uh, the greater good. And, and that's also, as a public institution, that's in our DNA. And so I think, you know, driving that into admissions, driving it into the way the market and, and the world thinks about not just the Haas School, but, but Berkeley, um, that's something that, that, that was very satisfying. So on a personal note, how do you spend your time when you're not at work? Uh, not at work, yeah. yeah. Well, my wife, Jen, is here. Could you wave your hand, Jen, please? Thank you very much. Uh, you are very lucky to have her. I just want to be very clear on, uh, no. so, so obviously Jen and I and, and our kids spend, spend a lot of time together. My, my favorite pastime is playing the guitar. Some of you uh, may have seen me play a tune or two. It's a steel string acoustic guitar, a, a Martin guitar, and I, I like to sing. I'm not a particularly studied singer, but, but when we all need a kind of meditation in our lives, and that's my meditation. And, and every morning, I actually go into our separated garage where nobody can hear me, and, and I play a, a little music. So that, that's probably, that's my, my place, yeah. All right, and so now a little bit about leadership skill, style. Um, so Berkeley is an amazing place. I mean, it really is, okay? And so what skills do you bring that will help you lead a university as historic, large, and complex as Berkeley? Good question. Um, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. No, I, look, this is, it's an important question. Uh, here's something I say all the time, and I just meet it in, to, my, to, to my very core. Um, Berkeley is one of society's most valuable assets, period. It just is. That's what we're stewarding here together. I mean, it's that important. And I think it's gonna get more important, right? These, these remarkable institutions. And so um, 
I, I guess I'm starting there, is like a deep respect for how important this, this institution is in society, not just to us, in society. Um, I think that's a tremendous motive force for, for keeping us really, really going after, making it better and better and better, because there's always, there's always better. That, that would be number one. I think number two is, um, it, it, if one of the things that I, I hope I bring to the table is the ability to see an opportunity and to put a team together to sort of scale it, to make it bigger, to make it like a narrative, like, wow, we all, we all get it now. Um, and th those, those high school defining principles are an example of that. It, it's um, tons of people worked on that. And, and they still get used all the time. You might imagine, that was like 2010 when we launched it. So we're, we're, we're 14 years down the road. And, and they're still getting used uh, for admissions and so forth. And look, er, lots of people worked on that. But I think there are a few things that I'm seeing. Well, let me put it this way. Carol Christ's magnificent leadership put us in a position <laughs> She put us in a position to think big. And there's some really big opportunities, right? Jill, Professor Finlayson talked, talked about a lot that was going on. There are some really remarkably big opportunities. So I guess that's part of it, is sort of wh where's the raw material and how do we make it big? How do we, as remarkable as this place already is, how do we change the game? For example, one of the things that I'm going through is, all right, it's 10 years from now. It's 10 years from now, and we're looking back over the last 10 years. And we're asking ourselves, what are the two or three things we're most proud of? Your earlier question, having happened. And I'll just, I'll just suggest to you, look, we, have, we need to go through a strategic planning process. I'm in listening mode. I can't be standing up here and telling you, here's the strategic plan for the campus over the next 10 years. But imagine if far and wide, the world order were over. Berkeley is understood to be as incomparable an institution as it actually is. And if you ask people around the country or around the world, but ask people around the country, what are the greatest research universities in, in the US today? Berkeley's gonna be on virtually every one of those lists. And it's gonna be the only public on a lot of lists. We are not, we are not, one of N, where N is a relatively small number, great research universities in this country. We are the only public on that last list. So when you start talking about singularity and incomparability, it's sort of like, that is not a crazy place. But I don't think we're appreciated at quite that level yet. And so when you have people like Malcolm Gladwell and Scott Galloway, if you listen to some of these thinkers, they are pointing at some of these very well-funded private universities. And they are saying, shame on you for educating so few students. Shame on you for saying that you are trying to maximize society's benefit. And then you run at the scale that you're running at? That is not consistent with delivering as much value to society as you can. And Berkeley's on the right side of that equation. So um, this, this idea of taking Berkeley's existing incomparability and letting the whole world know so that we become, in 10 years, the university of choice for faculty, staff, and students. That's the kind of thing that I, I, we need to paint that picture, and then we need, we need to make it happen. OK. Thank you. So um, last question. Your appointment came as colleges nationwide were embroiled in controversies around free speech racial and political diversity, and affordability. Yep. If you were to pull out your crystal ball, what do you imagine happening in the next school year, 24, 25, when it comes to protests, what is the administration doing to protect both free speech and the rights of others? These are fundamental questions you've all been reading. I mean, this is the front page of, of almost every newspaper any of us is reading for the last year and, and even before that. Um, it's really fundamental. Berkeley is as committed to free speech as it absolutely can be, and it will continue to be that way, right? Carol 
put her stake in the ground, chancellors before her did, and I'm 100% behind that element of Berkeley. Um, we also, we also, we have a set, so there are literally hundreds and hundreds of ways that our students and our faculty and staff and others, uh, our alumni, can express themselves in ways consistent with the First Amendment and free speech and so forth. Um, there are a few ways, though, that, that actually cross lines. Criminal activity, you'd say, well, obviously, that's, that's a cross line. But if you are directly disrupting education and classrooms and research and labs and things like that, you actually can't do that. So somebody who says, I have a First Amendment right to disrupt this class and prevent it from going on, that's not true, okay? Um, so, so we have to be very careful. I mean, free speech is, is not unlimited, right? Not all speech is protected under the First Amendment. We, we, all, we all know that. So you, you, with, with this commitment to free speech, there's also this idea of we need to manage a university that can get its work done, right? And that's part of what Carol, I think, really beautifully navigated over this last semester. But, um, you know, we have an election coming up. Whichever way that election goes, I don't know if you remember the, the, in, in 2017, the first few months of 2017, the election of 2016, many of you will remember. And there was a lot going on in February, March, and April of 2017 on this campus. Um, again, so, so the election is coming at us in a big way. Uh, something that I heard, I, I was at a UC Regents meeting just yesterday, and one of the chancellors made a comment and said, you know, encampments, which we've been reading about, right? This person said, um, encampments were like last semester, that the people that want to make a strong statement at our university, whether you agree with them or not, if, if you want to make a strong statement, you actually want helicopters overhead. You actually want zip ties. You want to be on the news, that's a win. And again, I'm not saying you should agree with that or not agree with that, but please understand it through that lens. And this person was saying, what's the next set of tactics? Will it be taking, taking buildings or rooms in buildings or what, what, what is it going to be? So um, it's, it, I, I, I hadn't quite thought about it that way, so we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. Uh, we have to respect the students' ability to express themselves, and that's a long tradition here, and we have to make sure that the mission of the university can, can continue. And I'll, I'll do my very best to sort of continue on a path. I think Carol, Carol did a beautiful job, but um, we, the, part of what the regents were saying and many other people are saying is that um, encampments have, have a bigger effect than, than people realize, and that many people feel unsafe in the face of these encampments. And uh, that's one of the things we're going to have to address. How quickly, they, they call it tiered response. How quick, if somebody breaks your rule, so I mentioned there are these time, place, manner rules. If you're breaking a rule, um, and tents are breaking a rule, then at what point do you move into tiered response? And how quickly does that tiered response get to things that involve, potentially, police on campus. Nobody wants police on campus. And yet, you have to start to think through that tiered response and try and manage uh, how we implement our rules while at the same time you know, being consistent with free speech that we all believe in. So, so that's the fundamental challenge, and there's no question that it will be before us uh, when the students come back. Well. Thank you for answering those questions. And now we're gonna entertain questions from the floor, which I believe Julie has for us. Collecting ball over here, sorry, collecting questions. Okay, so Rich, here's the first question. Oh, thank you, getting more. So tell us about the athletics department financial status. Ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, athletics is, is complicated. I don't need to tell you that, but you know, Athletics as, as a social phenomenon, you know, professional sports and so forth, is, is always very, very dynamic. But I think it's safe to say over the last year or two, um, it has just been as disruptive as any of us can imagine or, or remember. So, so there's no doubt about that. Here's one way to think about athletics, in my view, right? It's still a lot of conversations that need to happen. If you look at the athletics challenge, it's really big and it's really messy and it's hard to forecast. Um, I was taught when you have a big, crazy problem, break it down into its parts, 
and try to figure out how you're going to address its parts. Sometimes you miss interdependencies when you do problem solving that way, but, but that's a good place to start. We have three categories. Revenue sports, mostly men's basketball and, and football. We have, I'm, these, these category names are not exactly precise, but revenue sports, men's Olympic sports, and women's Olympic sports. And I think part of where we're trying to get, you know, the cost curve with this increasing professionalization in football and also men's basketball, um, those sports, as you know, used to cross-subsidize the other sports. In the near term, that's not true. And the question is, can we get football and basketball with distinguished, you know, performance records from at least funding themselves and not needing a subsidy from the campus, right? That's still hard to forecast, but that's, that's the goal in the category. On the men's Olympic sports, we have to get those funded. We're gonna, we're, we're, we've got some of the sports, two or three out of, out of this category, are fully endowed, but others are not fully endowed. How do we get them to half endowed? How many are currently half endowed? What does it take to get a sport to half endowment? We're going very hard over these next couple of years to get that middle category funded. And for the women's Olympic sports, that's an important area. We're committed to gender equality, Title IX, et cetera. That's an area where I can and will expend campus budget, even in steady state, to make sure that we can keep that funded. Now, those are the three parts. Um, one of the things that I've said, I'll say it here publicly, I have no intention to shut down sports in the next two years. We also have 30 varsity sports, many more than UCLA and many more than other places. So we need to get football and basketball in a sustained place. We need to get the men's Olympic sports in a sustained space, place. And we need to get budgets uh, consistent with Title IX in women's Olympic sports to a place where I can sustainably fund it and make it work on campus. And I think we have two, work, two years to work very hard to do that. And some of the uncertainties around, around ACC and, and conference realignment not all of them will have resolved in a couple of years. And that's, that's too long an answer to a very big question. Thank you, though. Uh, here's another big one. Uh, on the subject of low admissions rates, what are some of your thoughts? I assume this is undergraduate. What are some of your thoughts about making UC Berkeley more accessible to more students? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I think isn't evident to people, but I, I, uh, roughly over the last 10 years, if you just looked at California students, I think for some people, they think, even though we are, we are in fact, uh, educating more undergraduates today, but we are educating about 25% more California resident undergraduates today than we were 10 years ago. I'll bet you didn't know that, okay? Now, so, so that's, you know, that's an important commitment of the University of California. And another thing that's just absolutely terrific, and you know this, but, but part of the, the California master plan, 25, 30, sometimes up uh, above 30% of our students are transfer students. And that's a really important part of the social mobility and the engine that, that the University of California is. It's absolutely remarkable, uh, socioeconomically across many other categories of diversity as well. All right, um, so the question then is, how do we, look, we, we've expanded a lot our undergraduate footprint. Um, here's one of the things that Carol had an eagle eye on. U UCLA, I was at a, a meeting, I mentioned the Regents meeting. Uh, UCLA can promise its undergraduates four years of campus provided housing. Berkeley can't get anywhere near that. I don't know what percentage of the time we let somebody in and UCLA lets them in. They made the decision to go to UCLA because of housing, but it's not a small number. It actually isn't a small number. Now, Carol and the team have built a lot of housing, but if somebody says, just, you know, ju we just need to educate more Californians, it's sort of like, we've got housing constraints, we've got a lot, it's a system problem we're trying to solve here together, right? Um, does online education give us more effective capacity, right? A perfect question, right? But, Online education at the quality level that Berkeley expects and, and needs to deliver is, is not as simple as, as it sounds. So uh, I, I'll go back to that sort of, again, Malcolm Gladwell, Scott Galloway, people saying, you, you elite private schools, come on. I mean, we're going to start calling you out for the problem you are obviously solving, which isn't the problem that society most needs you to solve. 
and I think that we will continue to educate at a quality level that you, you want us to, uh, as many Californians as we can, but we can't be admitting students that we can't support with, with housing and, and other things. Thank you, Rich. So uh, Benjamin Eide Wheeler was a good fundraiser, as we've heard. Um, what do you think should be the right balance between state support and, a pri and private support at a public university such as Berkeley? Well, super important question, and you've all seen the data in terms of timing, right? So if you go back to when I was an undergrad, uh, it was at least 40% state funded, and it may have been closer to 50, and for some of you, it was, it was well above that. We're down at 12% right now. Uh, I think 10% is, a, this is a speculation, I think 10% is a kind of floor. I, I think if, if we drop below 10%, I think uh, our legislators would get a lot of letters. It would start, I, I, I sometimes, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the phrase, pardon me, but there, there's, there's a, well, I'm not going to use the phrase. Um, I think there's a floor at which our, our represented politicians would start to feel like uh, this has gone too far. Um, but do I think that it's going to go back? What's more likely? Are we going to get, if we're at 12% now, is 9% more likely or is 15% more likely? I think 9% is more likely. I think we just have to be honest with ourselves. I, I, I wish it weren't, weren't the case. Now, the, the budget that was just signed by the governor was actually very, given all the constraints and the deficit at the state level, was very generous to the University of California. And, and I want to say that. They really did do a lot of things they didn't have to do. And we were very happy about that. And we're still at like 12%. Um, so if you look at what happened at the University of Michigan and a lot of other universities, um, the, the non-resident, I, I have a daughter who happens to be at, at Michigan. And she, you know the, the non-resident tuition at Michigan is a good deal higher than the non-resident tuition here. And so um, I think that the quick answer is uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at 10% as a steady state, uh, at, and, and I doubt we'll fall a lot below that. I doubt we'll get much above that, and we're going to do our best to make sure that we have a financial model, given all the other components of our revenue uh, picture, to make sure that we can fund, you know, not just sustainability, but, but thriving, that we can fund the access and the excellence that make Berkeley, what I said before, incomparable. You put, I, uh, there, was, there was a phrase I heard the other day that I love. It's stunning what Berkeley is able to achieve at the scale that it achieves it. That's, that's the incomparability. And I don't think we're going to be able to rely on the state for, for a lot of that future vision. Thank you, Rich. Um, so, Rich, there are 20,000 retirees from Berkeley in the lab. What is our vision to leverage that institutional knowledge and commitment to help advocate and support for Berkeley? Well, it's a super question, and if you have ideas on how we can do that better, I think, you know, that we, we, do, we are much better organized than we were as a UC system and also at Berkeley in staying connected to our legislators and the people that are making such important decisions you know, because it's not just our operating budget when I say 12% of our operating budget, but, you know, we have buildings on campus that are going up that were paid for by the state, right? So it's, it's it, we, you have to see that whole picture. And I think our investment in those relationships, we're getting better and better at connecting. And a lot of our, our retirees, uh, faculty, staff, and, and alumni are, are helping us do that much better. So I think if you're interested in getting more involved in that, we are happy to provide you information on how you can get involved in, in that and, and influencing some of those state level decisions. Um, there's another element that, you know, for, it doesn't have to be for retirees, it could be more broadly for, for alumni, but wh what I was working on over the last five years was, as, as Julie mentioned, innovation and entrepreneurship. And we have an awful lot of alumni that are plugging into Berkeley through that doorway of innovation and entrepreneurship, right? They are mentoring our students. They're giving, they're giving a talk in one of our entrepreneurship classes, like Jill was talking about. They're serving as judges on panels. They're an advisor at Skydeck, some of the things that you heard about here. Uh, and I actually think athletics is a profoundly important front porch or living room, whatever the right metaphor is, for this university. There are a lot of us as alums that sort of stay connected through athletics. I think we're evolving to have a second front porch, and that front porch is innovation and entrepreneurship. 
and a lot of our alums are getting engaged in that area. These are not competing front porches, they're complementary. But the more really high level engagement categories, so for, you, for those of you that are retirees and, and others that, that you know of, um, ask us how can I as a retiree get more connected to innovation and entrepreneurship as an example. Uh, we actually do have new menus uh, of opportunities. Thank you. I have one more question for you. This is an interesting one. A few months ago, your predecessor, Carol, told me a few things she was not able to accomplish. Did she share any of those with you? Uh, bits and pieces, yes, yes. <laughs> he said yes and, okay, done. <laughs> I think you've probably covered on a few of them, don't you think? Yeah, well, so that's the end of the question? That was, that's oh, great. The, that's the end of the Thank question. Thank you for the Did guidance. Did she share any <laughs> of these with you? Um, well, you know, Carol set a goal of, you know, increasing the student housing stock, as I mentioned, by a significant amount and really achieved it. And we are still housing the lowest percentage of our undergraduates of all 10 of the UC campuses. So in other words, just as Carol was playing the long game, and student housing isn't the only category, we need to play the long game. It's like, when are we not going to be at the bottom of all 10 in terms of the percentage of our students that we can house. And what would that take? So I think I need to take that, we need to take that seriously over the next 10 years. I don't get to serve for 10 years unless I earn it, but, but if we're thinking about 10 years and, and maybe more, um, that's right at the top. So I think she would say I was happy with what, what we achieved and we have a lot of work yet to do in that category. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the athletics, you just, I think we have to point to athletics, right? A lot of those changes, fundamental changes in parameters occurred and, you know, she wasn't in the seat long enough to, to know exactly what to do next, nor, nor do I know exactly what to do next. I mentioned that three-part model, right? The, the revenue sports, the men's Olympic and the women's Olympic, but we're just starting, I think, to converge on a way to think about that in a systematic way. So you can imagine if you were Carol Chris, with all these tectonic shifts happening, you'd have to get, oh look, she, she is so warranted in, in, in the pride that all, all of what she achieved, and you'd have to be thinking about athletics and say, okay, uh, I left a portfolio of, of work to get done, and, and that's not her fault, the world, the world changed. So that would be a, another one. Thank you, Rich, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I think we have hit the end of our time together. I would love for everybody to give one more round of applause to Chancellor Lyons, to Jill, to Carl, thank you, to yourselves. Thank you for a great and engaging day. Uh, one very quick reminder before we leave, if you parked your car with the valet this morning, the attendants will meet you in the lower sprawl garage, which is accessible through Eshelman Hall. We're going to have staff that will help guide you to the elevators that get you down to the garage. So with that, I'm thrilled to welcome the Cal Band to close us out. Fiat Lux and Go Bears.